As we approach Easter, we're going to be camping for a little season here on one of Isaiah's great prophecies about Jesus Christ. And, we're, and of course, it's all one thing, but we break it apart to look at different aspects of it uh, over a few weeks. Today's segment deals, what we're going to use it to focus on is the nature of sin, the nature of sin. How sin blinds us to what is truly worthwhile and beautiful and true. Uh, and today I want to warn us to stay vigilant lest we at all uh, back away uh, from Christ and allow sin to blind us again. That's always, that's always a challenge. Let's, uh, let's work through this text. We'll start in Isaiah 52 verse 13. See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. This is one of Isaiah's famous servant songs. You see the name, the word servant there. The prophet proclaims a vision he had of a promised one who would fulfill God's saving covenant. And like any savior, he's going to be lifted up. He's going to be lifted up in glory above all others. But as we immediately see, the way he is lifted up is going to be rather different. Just as there were many who were appalled by him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man, and his form marred beyond human recognition. Deliverers tend to beat up on their enemies, but this Savior is the one who will be beaten up. Roman crosses were not uh, in Israel uh, uh, of, I of Isaiah's day, of course. Uh, the prophet would not have maybe comprehended uh, a vision of the cross, but he sure could describe what he saw. And what Isaiah saw in his vision was not just a man lifted up in some kind of suffering. He saw a man so disfigured, so pummeled, so ripped to shreds, so pierced, and so bloody that it's hard to believe this piece of meat is human. So will he sprinkle many nations and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see. And what they have not heard, they will understand. Here's the first shocking connection between the unthinkable act of, of human suffering that Isaiah sees and the forgiveness of sins. Sprinkle describes what a priest does with the blood of an animal sacrifice, using it to atone or cover sin with blood. In other words, Isaiah understands that God will send this servant to cover our sins. And not only Jewish sins, but he will... He will die to provide forgiveness for the sins of many nations. Gentile sinners who have never before heard of the Old Testament will understand God's Old Testament covenant gospel is actually for them. And they will find the sacrifice so amazing that it will leave them speechless in wonder. Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground. Sadly, Israel would not respond as the Gentiles would. That was known way back here. God's servant, God's savior would grow up among them like a healthy plant rising out of a desert. But as a people, they would not believe his message. They would not accept the Old Testament covenant was fundamentally about holiness through God's grace rather than holiness through their own efforts. This is how they would see him. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. This is the text we're going to focus on today because we see here a great characteristic of human sin. Our sin finds nothing in Jesus' death that is attractive. He was despised. He was rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Apart from faith, this bloody mess only looks disgusting, ugly, embarrassing, something to flee from, not run toward. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. All the suffering he endured would be for us, and that's something we're going to examine and its impact next week in the next segment. But the point today, as we run up to that, is that our sin tends to make Jesus look unattractive to us. Not someone to embrace, but someone to push away. 
Roman crucifixion was a carefully applied form of government terrorism. It could be used to enforce law when that was deemed necessary, but specifically it locked down rebellion. It branded rebels as losers in no uncertain terms, people you do not want to follow. Jesus was crucified because to the normal way of thinking, what he stood for is a radical rebellion against the way of this world and the way we naturally want to live. Jesus preached and he lived a radically different kind of life. God in human form lived the way we were meant to live, according to our Creator. He put God first, always. He considered the needs of others, always. He was committed to both justice and compassion, always. He was guided by God's will and not public approval or pragmatism. This is not how we have chosen to live or have designed our world to run. And so Jesus was and Jesus is always a threat. He threatened the Roman status quo. He threatened the Jewish status quo. He threatens the status quo of anybody who gets near him. I can tell you, he turned my life absolutely upside down, put huge strains uh, with, between me and, and my family. He uh, took me out of years of academic training, put me in a, in a profession which was the last I ever thought I would be in. Let me tell you, Jesus is dangerous. <laughs> He's dangerous to life as we know it. Jesus lived without the fear and the self-promotion that this world counts on you having. He demonstrated what it looks like to trust God, to know God, to love all that God has made. Jesus was crucified because he had the gall to exist and to expose the people we are not and never could be and to our shame would never want to be. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. Jesus was crucified to demonstrate how we naturally feel about God. From our sinful perspective, God's will looks and smells like death. If Jesus had just lived as he did, we could accept him as a freak, a saint that we could lift up on a marble pedestal and worship from afar. But he said that the noble goodness that he was is what we are supposed to be and that God is going to hold us accountable for what we are supposed to be and that in grace God provides a way to transform us into what we're supposed to be. Great. But what if you don't want to be transformed? The Jewish temple leaders didn't want to be transformed. Pilate didn't want to be transformed. Millions and millions of people do not want to be transformed into somebody who turns the other cheek and loves his enemies and who lives a pure life, enjoying God's creation, enjoying God's love, and sharing it with every human being equally. Every human being equally. It's not just that we don't do those things. We don't want to do them. Jesus was crucified to demonstrate what sinners like me see in him. Apart from God's grace, we see death, and we don't want to die. We don't want to die to who we are and how we live, so crucify him. This is somebody you really don't want to follow. Well, then, you know, why are we here? Well, we're here because while we use the cross to demonstrate how we feel about, about God... The living God used the cross to demonstrate how he feels about his people. God demonstrated his own love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. See, everything changes. I mean, everything changes when you understand that it was God in Jesus on the cross and that he willingly accepted crucifixion for our sake. And why would we believe that? Because he rose from the dead. If God in Christ did what Isaiah said he was going to do, if he offered himself as a willing substitute to absorb his own wrath, then suddenly the cross does the impossible. It demonstrates two things at the same time. 
It demonstrates God's love in that he would go to such lengths to save us. And it demonstrates God's righteousness in that he had to go to such lengths to save us. Forgiveness requires dealing justly with our moral failures because they matter. God is not going to ignore the way we abuse and hurt and humiliate each other. He will not. What he will do, though, is pay for those sins, cover the cost himself, and stand in our place for our judgment. Now, look what happens. And this is the only place you're going to see it happen is on the cross. Look what happens when you see God's love and righteousness combine together. What happens is that God's love enables us to trust him. All our lives, we have been afraid that God didn't care. That predisposition is part of the heritage of human sin. We're born with it. But if he died for us, then we were wrong, and we can trust him. And if we're convinced of God's righteousness, if God loves us and his righteousness is so important, then it would be stupid to continue living the way we used to. So faith, real faith, always begins a process of repentance. We get to repent. We get to live a better life. We get to reconsider our lives and gradually take, make changes to be more like him. So what's happened, without our even being aware of it perhaps, is that we start, uh, Christ's death for sin starts causing us to die to sin. As we die to our old way of living, at the same time being raised spiritually to a new one, a better one, an eternal one. And so now we look at Jesus' death on that cross and we see something different. We see something marvelous. We see our own death to fear. We see our own death to self-righteousness. We see our own death to hatred and bigotry and greed and lust and violence. We see our own death to death itself. And that dying figure on the cross has become beautiful because in him we are dying to everything we have reason to be ashamed of. And the new person that we're becoming is more and more and more like Jesus himself. And of course, that doesn't happen instantly upon faith. It's a process. It begins at our conversion and just continues. We have a long way to go. So we have to keep drawing near to the cross. We have to keep practicing finding beauty in his death the death that causes us to die, to everything unworthy, everything God wants purged from our system so we can be clean and good and wise. We can't afford anything that pushes us back the other way, away from the cross, rekindling the old sinful aversion to that wonderful person who Jesus is and that we can become. Which is why we are in a dangerous season right now. It's a, it's a regular part of our life. It's election time. You know, I am so grateful to live in a free country in which I have a small say in who leads me. Even if the process is messy. I agree with what Winston Churchill said in the British House of Commons in 1947. These are his exact words. He said, many forms of government have been tried and will be tried in this world of sin and woe. Good words. No one pretends that democracy is perfect or all wise. Indeed, it has been said that democracy is the worst form of government, except for all other forms that have been tried. Okay. Well, this election is putting that confidence to the test, isn't it? It's been negative. It's been vicious. It's been vulgar. It's now becoming violent. And it's not over yet. Its tone has perhaps been the worst that I can remember, and I've seen 14 of these things in my life. Some well-known Christians, some whom I deeply respect, have come out expressing concern about the vulgarity, the juvenile remarks, the prodding of, of prejudices, and so on, the over-the-top the top verbal abuse, uh, and so on. And I agree with them. I mean, simply as an American, I wish that things could be different. And I can get disheartened and uh, dismayed. But my deepest concern is somewhere else as a pastor. And it's, it's a concern I have every time we go through this. It's not just this time. Uh, I don't expect uh, politics to be nice and tidy. I would like my leaders to be exemplary human beings, but that's not always going to happen. In the Bible, and we'll see this when we get back to Romans, God raises up a lot of very 
very imperfect sinners to lead the nations of this world. And he raises them up. Even the leaders of God's own people were known for their sins. Now what I'm concerned, uh, you know, I am concerned about the breakdown of, of our process, but I'm much more concerned with the fallout it has on God's people. And I'm, I'm concerned every time we go through this. People like you and me who need to keep our focus on Christ. We need to keep our focus on Christ. And did I say that we need to keep our focus on Christ? We need to keep drawing near to the cross and the new life it points to rather than shy away from the cross and drift back into fear and hatred or worse. Our political system, by its very nature, tends toward polarization and simplification. Polarization in that you have to end up with a defined choice to make. Two mutually exclusive candidates you're either for or against. That's what we're always heading towards. Simplification, because there are a host of extremely complex issues, each one involving several moral questions, and different people with different interests impacted in different ways. And every four years, we force ourselves to stuff all of this complexity into the shape of either an elephant or a donkey. <laughs> and the idea that either side has everything all wrapped up nicely on any issue is a myth. But their job is to make you believe that they've got everything covered. That's what they've got to do. Pointing out the flaws in one's own position, and there are always flaws, and pointing out the good in your opponent's position, and there's sometimes good over there, that's not something the candidate's going to spend a lot of time doing. It's not, it's not how we do things. Now, in the end, we're all going to have to pick somebody that we feel is the best. We're going to weigh probably one or two issues that we believe are the most important, and we're going to disagree on what those are. And we're going to estimate the quality of the human being that we're dealing with, and we're going to make an educated guess. And that's okay. I am very grateful to have that much input into who leads us. It's a whole lot better way to choose leaders than to see who has the biggest militia, okay? But this is a dangerous time for us spiritually, for people like us who claim to already have a king, who already have a leader. Because candidates are free to demonstrate any kind of character they wish. We are not. We follow a king who commands truth. Balanced truth, clearly spoken in love and gentleness. Candidates are free to say, only these things are important. We are not. Any issue with moral consequences is our concern. Even if we vote for someone because we think that he or she has got the best overall you know, approach to things, that does not mean that they get to restrict the way we care about things and that we're restricted to care about only the things they care about. We follow a king who is Lord of all. Candidates are free to play on our dark side, push buttons of fear and prejudice and hatred and self-righteousness and greed, and they've all got their different buttons. Any buttons that'll work. We're not allowed to play there. And that's perhaps the greatest danger for all of us because sometimes politics will look at some of the sinful pieces of our old life and say, we don't really want to die to that. Actually, we want to rekindle some of those destructive fires. Vote for me, and let me tell you which virtues are important. And they're probably good ones. But that also means I'm telling you which virtues to neglect. You vote for me, and let me tell you which sins ought to be dealt with, and they probably should. But that's also which sins we ought to leave alone. And here's what we've got to watch out for every time we go through this. Because of polarization and simplification, we're going to be attracted, each of us, to the candidate who extols the virtues most important to us. And that's a good thing. But that same candidate, because of the way things work, may hide or protect the sins we are least willing to abandon. 
And that's not so good. While we will be drawn to the candidate who best represents our treasured that virtues, that same candidate may very well excuse or even support in wor our worst vices and weaknesses and prejudices, either intentionally or just because they left them out. It's awfully hard to, to kind of explore uh, all of the issues about national security and justice for the oppressed. It's hard to emphasize both health care for all and respect for personal wealth. It's hard to emphasize the responsibility to care for this planet and the need to create jobs to support families. It's hard to emphasize the right to live according to our conscience and encourage the best behavior for society. Godliness will, will, will support and pursue all those things. But because of the polarization and simplification of politics, candidates are going to start pushing to magnify one thing or the other thing. Even if they don't want to do that, that's the nature of the case. As citizens, we must give our vote to whoever we believe is the best right now of the choices before us. And we can work for that. But as Christians, we must never allow that choice to drive us further from the cross so that the death of Jesus and the new life that he offers us is lost in the shuffle. Regardless of who we vote for in any election, we may not choose one good thing to the exclusion of other good things. We may not embrace bad things, buying into the lie that we must be evil to do good. Regardless of who our candidate that we choose cares for, we must care for everyone. If we don't do that, then Jesus becomes just one more candidate seeking our vote. You know, Jesus, he's pro everything good. He's anti everything bad. He insists that we love everyone in every context equally. He insists that we apply truth in every direction all at once. Therefore, no sinner will ever vote for him because nobody on this side of heaven wants that, wants to do all of that. We naturally want to do what we want to do. If Jesus were in a debate, that attitude just wouldn't be good enough. But wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Didn't we already have that debate? Didn't we already have that debate with Pilate as moderator? Didn't we already get to vote on whom we wanted? Jesus, the king of the Jews, who taught us to turn the other cheek and love our enemies and give, us, give our enemies more than they ask uh, of us and show them God's love through sacrificial care and so on, so on, so on. Or Barabbas. Barabbas, a crass bully, who in his context hated the enemies in his land, the Romans, fomented hatred, wanted them thrown out violently because that was the issue of his day. If it had been a different day, it would have been a different issue. But he believed that these are the things that really mattered right now. Who are sinners going to vote for? We'll take Barabbas every time. If we're going to make this a, 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 an election about our ultimate values, Barabbas is going to win if we bring Jesus down to that level. Brothers and sisters, this is not a choice we should ever consider making. We have to pick the best candidate we can find to rule over our nation. But we must never choose anyone other than Jesus to rule over us. We have a king. Faith makes the cross beautiful. It's the only thing that does make his death. Let's not let political rhetoric blind us to that. Beware. I don't care who you're looking at. Beware whenever you find someone catering to prejudices that we don't want to abandon or grievances that we don't want to forget or kindnesses that we don't want to show or generosity that we don't want to give or fear and hatred we desperately want to hang on to because we're not like Jesus yet. What's the assignment? This is an assignment not just for this week, but for the whole season. 
We're going to be thinking a lot about how we're going to vote and who's going to be the best candidate, I hope. We have to be involved in this. We're part of this country. And we're naturally going to be talking about those things as we should, but I want to suggest that we add something to the conversation. And maybe this is something we'll be comfortable adding mostly when we're talking with other believers and we can be kind of honest and open. Let's look at the candidates or the platform that we are leaning toward supporting and assume for the sake of argument it's the best choice. Well, let's add, let's discuss now how that choice is lacking. Maybe it's the best on the table, but how is it lacking from a Christian point of view? Now, maybe I will not change my vote, but the point is, I don't want my vote to change me. How is my candidate or platform resuscitating parts of me that Jesus wants to die? In other words, how do our political battles reveal ways in which I still find Jesus unattractive? Isn't that terrible to say? Isn't that terrible? What gracious virtues or convictions does my candidate minimize? Now, they emphasize other things that I appreciate. What do they minimize? And I'm sorry to say that points out a weakness in me. Or what aspects of grace does he or she find too scary, too costly? And I'm, I'm sorry to say that points out a weakness in me too. And let's discuss explicitly how Jesus is truly more attractive than anyone else. More attractive than I've ever given him credit for. As I do my best to live in this world without becoming of this world. Now look. I may still end up supporting the candidate I originally chose. But when it comes to who I am and what I believe and how I'm going to live, I vote only for Jesus. Okay. Let's pray. Father, in this, uh, this very tumultuous political cycle, and, I, and I, I'm concerned about where I may go from here, please help us to keep focused on our Lord and Savior. Please do not allow anyone to take his place in our affections, obscuring his will for us and pushing us away from that holiness which he calls us to pursue. Together now, we ask for wisdom to consider all the issues carefully and to consider the character of the candidates carefully. And we ask you to work through our future leaders to provide us with the peace and the prosperity we need as your people to serve you well and serve you in freedom and serve you in joyful sacrifice. And Father, whatever your will and whoever you raise up, we're going to be faithful to thank you for them and ask your blessing upon them. But please do not allow anyone to reduce Jesus to just another candidate competing for our loyalty and passion and commitment. Don't let anyone in any way make Jesus seem less attractive to us. We confess to you that we are not voting for the Savior of the world and the Lord of our lives. That position is already filled. By your grace, we will revisit your son's cross every day. And every day, remember the one who is beautiful in your eyes. And we will have nothing distract us from dying a little more in him every day. So that in every day, we might taste the good and eternal power of his resurrection. Hear us, Father. For you have given us the privilege of praying in your son's name. Amen.